today, I want to preach from the subject this afternoon. We're in our relationship series. I want to preach from the subject today, same couple, new covenant. Everybody say that, same couple, new covenant. Same couple, new covenant. Um, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Zion. Thank you, Chance. To uh, all of you, I'm grateful to each of you. For, give God praise for our band. They do a tremendous job. Amen. We're grateful for those who lead us in the spirit. Amen. Can I, can I do one more thing before I... Uh, before I you gotta, before I uh, before I go into the word, I really felt led of the Holy Spirit to just say this publicly. I want to thank God for Minister Jeremiah and Shakira Islar. <laughs> I need you to hear why. Every Sunday, they just moved to Waldorf, but every Sunday they used to live in Hanover, right, by BWI Airport. Every Sunday they leave their house drive down to my house in Fort Washington to pick me up at 7.15 a.m. and drive me all the way to Aberdeen, Maryland. Y'all didn't hear what I said. They drive me all the way back to the DMV. Sometimes if I have to go somewhere else in the afternoon, they'll drive me there too and drive back to Hanover and don't ask me for a dime. I am grateful for people who want to serve like that. And I want, to, I want to appreciate them, not just privately, but I want to appreciate them publicly that they keep their pastor's energy up because I don't have to drive. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shakir. Thank you. Come on, those who serve your pastor, you want to celebrate them. I'm less tired because they do what they do. Thank God they just moved to Waldorf so they ain't got to drive. Well, Waldorf is kind of... Waldorf is in a whole other state. But it's not as far... <laughs> It's not as far as, uh, as Hanover, but I woke up this morning with just such gratefulness in my heart, and the Lord uh, just had me to say that publicly because I want you all to see that there's no level, there should be no limit to how you serve each other. Yeah. Amen. Amen, somebody? Yeah. No limit to how you serve each other. The truth is they do it for me, but they'll do it for anybody yeah. because we're supposed to serve one another in love. Amen? Amen. Tell somebody limitless serving. Tell them, tell them. There's nothing that I won't do to make the gospel be preached. I'm grateful for that. Uh, same couple. Everyone say same couple. Same couple. New, covenant. New covenant. You know, the truth be told, um, <clears throat> we, uh, Lord, thank you for this word. You're already in this house. I just ask that you bless these imperfect lips to part your perfect word that our lives may be changed. Now let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable. You did it for me this morning. Do it again this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, it's, it's really important that we understand um, that whenever you talk about a covenant, when you stand before God and you get married, it is a covenant not between two, but it's a covenant between three people. One of them being a supreme being, of course. Marriage is between you, your spouse, and God. God is responsible for instituting that covenant. I want to tell you, Restoration Church, that if God is responsible for putting your covenant together, then God is responsible for keeping your covenant together. If you trusted God to, to uh, establish the covenant, then you've got to trust that same God to maintain that covenant. It means that both of you have got to have, uh, thank you Holy Ghost, you've got to have a relationship with the Lord individually. And watch this, you've got to have a relationship with the Lord together. Because your individual relationship with God is different from your corporate relationship with God. The way we know God is not always the same way that I know God. And truth be told, here's the problem. I know God better than we do. I don't have nobody talking to me yet. I know God better than we do. And it should we need to get to a place in God where we knowing God is just as potent as me knowing God. I don't want to have a prayer life and leave my spouse behind. I don't want to fast and leave my spouse behind. I don't want to be studying my word. The Lord is feeding me all this word. When my husband comes in or my wife comes into the room, I'm in the presence of God. And I never invite them into the presence of God with me. 
at some point we have got to know him as well as I know him and for too many of us we have settled with us having different levels of God now let me be let me be let me be clear no two people will ever be 100 and 100 there's always going to be somebody ahead of somebody but we become comfortable leaving our spouse behind well, if you don't want to pray, then you don't have to pray. I'll pray by myself. No, baby. When you sit at this altar, you decided to be one. And when it's one, it means that whatever you're doing, you got to make sure that you live a life and an example before them that they can see Jesus in you. Jesus said it like this. Let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. If we are going to have a, a, a genuine, uh, uh, strong a robust uh, marriage, then we've got to do this. Number one, we've got to take a deep look within ourselves. Everybody say that. Say, take a deep look within ourselves. Oh, come on, say it louder than that. Say, take a deep look within ourselves. To take a deep look within ourselves, you're going to be making a lot of notes today. So if you sit now without making notes, I would, I, would, I would encourage you to make notes today unless you're an Android user. Number one, you, you've got to understand, <laughs> understand this. That in order to take a good look at yourself, be quiet, Daisha. To take a good look at yourself, uh, <laughs> I love her, I'm joking. L learn to forgive quickly and deeply. I'm giving you exactly how the Lord gave it to me. Learn to forgive quickly and what? Deeply. There are some, there are some things that your spouse does that requires a deep forgiveness. You know what a deep forgiveness is? A deep forgiveness is when you have to keep forgiving them for the same offense. They did it one time, but you have to forgive them again. You have to keep reminding yourself that you forgave that. And you forgave that. And you forgave that. Because if not, when you get angry, you'll bring up what you forgave. <laughs> and so you don't only have to forgive quickly, but everyone say you have to forgive deeply. It's important, Restoration Church, that we come to a place in our walk with God if we're going to learn who we are. Here's the reality. Here's the reality of, of relationships, especially married couples. We have painted a picture that isn't really real, right? We, 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 we have based our opinion and our, uh, what's the word, our pursuit of a perfect relationship through what we saw on television, so how many remember Cliff and, uh, Cliff and Claire Huxtable? Y'all yes. not talking to me in here today. Yes. Amen. Cliff and, what's his name? That's what I thought. I didn't want to say it because I wasn't sure. But Heathcliff and Claire Huxtable. They were the perfect couple. I mean, he was a doctor and she was a, a lawyer. And they had all these children. And it just seemed like the most perfect 30 minutes of just great family time. And they would go through they would go through issues and they would have concerns. I'm okay. Go through issues and have concerns. And, and, and by the end of the episode, everybody was fine. Can I announce to you? Heathcliff and Claire are not real people. His name is Bill Cosby. We know Bill Cosby's story. Felicia Rashad has been married a bunch of times. I'm not talking about two and three. I'm talking about five and six. Claire Huxtable still has her husband. Felicia Rashad is on number seven. So when you talk about real relationships, we can't base it off NBC. When you talk about a real relationship, you can't base it off Uncle Phil and Aunt Viv. He had a dark skin and a light skin. What happened? It's not real. We, bank, we, we, we have fashioned our relationships after relationships that were never real. There's a reality to marriage and sometimes marriage is hard work. Let me tell you why marriage is hard work. Are you ready? And I'm, I'm not going to get a response here, Deacon Kim. But let me tell you why marriage is hard work. Because I'm hard work. Uh, I know you thought I was going to come and just talk about your spouse, but let me talk about you real quick. I need you to look at somebody and say, I'm hard work. Uh-huh. You're not as cool as you think you are. You're cool because you live by yourself. But when you live by somebody with somebody else, you're going to find out real quick how much of a hard job you are. Because there ain't nothing like living with somebody to recognize the flaws that you have within the inside of you. Amen. How many of you know your hard work? Come on, let your pride down for a second and tell somebody else, say, I'm, I'm hard work. Now, imagine you being hard work and you then connected with somebody else 
That's hard work. How do you call that perfection? That sounds like a disaster. I'm hard work. Your hard work. When you put it together, it's double hard work. Sounds like we should be single. It sounds, it sounds like a wreck. If, if, if I have emotional imbalances and I have childhood trauma and I have abandonment issues and I have anxiety issues and then coupled with your pride and coupled with your lack of love and coupled with, coupled with everything that you're dealing with and put those two people together, it just sounds like a disaster. And then we get married. Oh, congratulations. Your trauma and your trauma. Huh? But then when these two people get together at the altar and they stand under a perfect God, God is able to mix all of that stuff into a beautiful presentation of his glory. Your main assignment as a couple is to give God more glory together than you do apart. One can chase a thousand. I need someone who knows the scripture in here. But two can put 10,000 to flight. I am better with you than I am by myself. Talk to me, married couples. I am better with you. Listen, I could do bad all by. But when I'm better with you, I'm less bad. I don't know if I'm good because only God is good. But I'm less. I'm less trouble. When I am. Le I like that. Less of a mess. When I am. When I am with you. So the question, go, the question becomes, if I know that I'm hard work, and I know that he is hard work or she is hard work, and the two of us are trying to work this out together, where do we go from here? Where, 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 Pastor, I've been married for 10 years. I've been married for 15 years. I've been married for 20 years. I've been married for two years. And yes, marriage is hard work. Let me, let me put a plug in here real quick for those of you who are not married. Marriage is also beautiful, so don't let me scare you. I just want to tell you the truth. There's a good side and there's an ugly side. But if you trust a good God, he makes even your ugly look good. Amen. Come on, somebody. It's, it's not all bad. But I don't want to tell you the truth. I don't want to lie to you and tell you that it's all bliss either. Because I'm not a blissful person. And, and the person you're dating is not a blissful person. I don't know if blissful is a word, but let's go with it. Amen. Thank you. We got English majors in here today. Where do we go from here? The question is, where do we, how, do we, how do we fashion a strong, robust, anointed marriage from here? Today I want to give you some practical, uh, practical uh, uh, things that the Lord told me to give you. Is that all right? We'll deal with the spiritual in a minute, but let me go with the practical real quick. If we're going to have a strong, robust uh, relationship that pleases the Lord, let me give you some practical things. Even if you're single, write this down. Schedule hard conversations. <laughs> Schedule hard conversations. Here, here's the reality of, of our conversations. Most of the time when we're angry, we try to deal with it right there in that moment. And 99% of the time, it never works out for your good. I'm going to deal with this right now. That's never worked out. Let me tell you why that doesn't work. Because when you are that angry, the only thing you're looking to do is win an argument. We're not trying to win our relationship. We're trying to win an argument. So the last thing you want to do is come at me when I don't want to be came at. Because now we're just attacking each other. Come on, somebody. Aren't we just, at, at, at this point, we're just attacking each other. We, to schedule a conversation is to promote healthy conversations over toxic conversations. And sometimes to have a healthy conversation, we got to pause for a second and say, I'm just going to say it right now. No, no, no. Calm yourself down. Come back tonight and let's have a healthy conversation. Am I, am I talking to anybody in this room? Because here's what happens when you don't have a healthy conversation. You start you and me. Do me a favor. Look at somebody and say, stop you and me. It's never, it's never me against you. So when you're having a conversation with me, talking about, oh, you do this and you do that. You, 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 you do this. And you're, you're an angry person. No, tell me I have an anger problem. But don't tell me I'm an angry person. Because when you tell me I'm an angry person, I'm going to tell you that you mean. I'm going to tell you everything that's wrong with you. Your teeth is crooked. Your, your shoes don't fit. 
your hair's not yours. I mean, I'll find stuff. Anybody ever found some stuff that you know that you just, you could just pull out the, the back pocket? Pa! I'm just, I'm just, I'm, it's not even about winning at this point. I just want to get my point out. Pa! You don't lotion yourself. Uh. You stink. When you start you and me, it now becomes an attack. And nobody wins when we're in a war. It's just you, 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 you. No, you, 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 you. You, 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 you. Just throwing you bombs, you bombs. And you bombs soon turn into F bombs if you ain't careful. And F bombs, listen, if you're not careful, turn into trigger bombs. And once you hit my trigger, sometimes it's no coming back. Am I talking to somebody in this room? There are some things that you can say that an apology cannot fix. That's the reality. When you're finished saying sorry and I forgive you, the truth is it's going to take me 15 years of therapy to deal with that 15 second comment you said. Because in your anger you said that I was fat and I heard you. Now, next time you tell me I'm beautiful, I can't hear you no more. Because in your anger, truth came out. And now every time I look in the mirror, I'm reminded of what you said. You told me that I'm not a good leader. So now when you ask me to pray for the family, I feel inadequate because you said something in 15 seconds that's going to mess me up for the next 10 years. Because when you said I'm not a good leader, I also heard my mother say I wasn't a good child. When you start dealing with triggers... Now you're in trouble. We can fix all of that by scheduling a conversation. Because with scheduling a conversation, I can get my thoughts together. I can think about how to, how to communicate how I feel without trying to hurt you. Amen. Everyone say, schedule difficult conversations. Uh, if you're going to have a strong... Are y'all getting something out of this today? If you're, going to have a strong, if you're going to have a strong marriage, you're going to have to learn also, number two, to identify what makes you most fruitful as a couple. Identify what makes you most fruitful. Those of you who are married, and again, the singles, write this down because you're going to, have to you're going to need some information when you get married or get married again. No, no, I mean that sincerely. Some people who are divorced want to get married again. You're going to need this information for the next, the next boo. Amen. That was not shade. That was real. Amen. Um, you're gonna need to you're gonna need to uh, identify the good parts of your relationship. Now, for those of you who are in a, ma a marriage, you should be able to identify a fruitful season. When was things at its best? When was things at its now? There's, there's certain parameters. You have to you have to bypass vacation. <laughs> because you'd be like, ah, oh, we was at our best when we was at Barbados, baby. You do not live in Barbados. You live in Clinton, Maryland. There ain't no bit beach here in Clinton, Maryland. There's no, there's no water with blue water and white sand. There's none of that here. So, so, so the vacation has to be bypassed. You have to exclude your vacation. When were you in a good space, in a good season within your marriage while you were at home? And how can you get to a place where you can repeat that season? Hallelujah, glory to God. I, I, I skipped over something. Can you, can, those of you who are making notes, just, uh, just put this before that. Um, apples, you know how to space and then put it before. Androids, it's like a typewriter. I don't know what you're going to do. Uh, <laughs> I, I forgot to tell you something. I want to I drop it in because what I'm getting ready to tell you sets up what I'm getting ready to say. Uh, every, every married couple needs the three C's. The Lord gave me this last night. Um, and I want to I wanna, uh, make sure I drop this on you before because it sets up the rest of it. You need the three C's. Uh, number one, every couple needs Christ. E everything starts with him. Everything. Every, say, everything starts with him. If I don't take it to him, what am I doing? If, he's not the, if he is not the covenant keeper of my relationship, what am I doing? Now, that might, that might seem simple to you. I can see it on your face. Says, well, of course, everything starts with Christ. No, you, th that, that's the problem. We, we take it for granted. But how do you actually put Christ in your relationship? 
What are you actually doing to put Christ? Are you actually praying together? I know y'all pray apart, but do you pray together? I know you read your Bible by yourself, but when, do you, when is the last time you read together? When was the last time you read a devotional together? When was the last time you worshipped together? I know you like bucking and dancing in church together, but if that's all you got in a relationship, you ain't got very much. When is the last time you just talked about the scriptures together? So th these are ways you put Christ first in your relationship. It's not just, it's not just saying, oh yeah, he's first. No, it's, it's, it's bringing it into fruition. Like for real, exactly. Amen. Number two. So number one is what? You need what? Christ. Number two, you need counsel. You need wise counsel. Who do you go to when your marriage is in trouble? Listen to me, church. Listen to me. Listen to me very carefully. You can't go to your person when we're in trouble. Hey Amen. I don't have nobody talking to me on this side. You can't, you can't go to your person when we're in trouble, and we can't go to my person when we're in trouble. We have to pick a neutral counsel when we have an issue. A neutral counsel is somebody that, that's not on your side, somebody that, that's not on my side, somebody who can be right down the middle and give you a response based on the word of God. This is what the word of God says about your marriage. Bruh, you wrong. Based on the word. This is what the scripture says about you. Sis, you're wrong. This is what the word of God says about you. And I'm not trying to be your friend. If you never talk to me again, I'm okay. My job in your life is to be a neutral counsel. Amen, somebody? For some, that's their pastor. My job is to be a neutral counsel. My job is not to be your friend. So I counsel couples in our church, and when they sit down with me, my job is to be neutral. I may know this person 10 years and this person two days. It doesn't matter. Once you sit in front of me, my job is, is to hear what you got to say and give you a response based on the word of God. But your pastor doesn't have to be your only counsel. Amen, somebody. But your counsel also can't be your mama. Amen. Because they're always going to have a bias. Come on, don't look at me like that. You know your mama love you. And she will always love you more. Come on now. I don't have a church here, Jeremiah. More people were talking to me in Aberdeen. To talk back to me and tell me, say, come on, mama is for you. Daddy is for you. You need someone who can be neutral. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Mama is supposed to be for you. She's doing her job. Dad is supposed to be for you, which is why sometimes you got to find somebody who is for both of you. Who is, who is a neutral counsel? So number one, you need Christ. Number two, you need what? Counsel. counsel. Number three, every couple that's going to make it needs a community. Needs a community. Um, you need other couples that can push you in the season that you're in. Amen, somebody. Now, let me help you with this. Um, uh, let me see if I can help you with this. Uh, your community changes from season to season you don't have to have the same community for the rest of your life friends last forever communities have seasons right i look back over my 13 years of marriage there was a community when i first got married when i didn't have any children and they didn't have any children and so you know we was good and then and then i started pastoring and the community i had no longer worked because they can't relate to me in the season that i'm in so i had to find me another community that understood ministry and marriage then I had ministry, and then we were having children. So now the, minister, the, the couple that we had that had no children but had a ministry couldn't relate to us no more because I need someone who knows how to do ministry, marriage, and parenting well. So now I need a new community. I'm still friends with all of them because friendship can last forever. Communities last for a season. And some of us are holding on to old communities when you're in a new season. Don't keep trying to call them all the time. Maybe that community is over. And God is bringing you into a new community. My wife and I, we were preaching somewhere. I was preaching somewhere this week. And we met a couple where we were. Oh, oh. I was like, what's going on? Amen. I'm sorry. I said we were preaching. She was not preaching. My wife is not a preacher. She, she takes great pleasure in reminding me that she's not a preacher. Amen. I said, I've tried for years to get her to preach. She's like, I told you. Get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> I was preaching somewhere and she was with me amen and we met a couple this weekend a couple that's a ministry couple a couple that has uh, children and they understand our, our season of life that we're in and as they talked we were able to relate to them and, and, and we found what? new community 
and come to find out we were hundreds of miles away and found out they lived down the street from us. So sometimes God will place you in environments that you need, that you didn't even know you needed. Don't hold on to old communities because they're fr- keep your friend, but stay loose with your community. Because in different seasons of your life, you need different communities. Who is your community today? And your community has got to be pro-marriage. Come on, somebody. You don't need nobody in your community that's crazier than you. I need someone to talk back to me in this church. No, I need some couples I can look up to. I need some couples I can look across the table at and respect. Even if you're not ahead of me, I need to be able to respect you. Amen. And we can go out and we can have a good time and, and somebody's watching all of our kids and we can go and spend a weekend away and, and do all this great stuff and, and go on Instagram and post a couple goals, you know. <laughs> Everyone say community. community. Say it one more time. Say community. community. All right. So we need to be able to identify what makes us most fruitful. We've got to be able to uh, also... If, uh, we've got to be able to have those three things again, Christ, counsel, community. The other thing we've got to do, and I need you to hear me. This is, may not be for everybody, but it is for some people in this room. If you're going to have a successful marriage, you've got to be willing to shake off the shame. Got to be willing to shake off the shame. I'm talking to those of you who have offended your spouse. Your spouse has forgiven you, but you haven't forgiven yourself. You've got to be willing, because what's going to happen, if you don't shake off the shame, you'll never love him right, or you'll never love her right. You'll always be competing with the old you. So now when you take her out for, on a date, it's not real. It's, it's like, I'm, I'm trying to do whatever I can to keep her happy. I'm trying to let her know that I'm not the person I used to be. And all she needs is for you to be authentic to who you are today. Because trust me, when I forgive you, I don't need you to keep proving yourself to me. Because, he, he, hear me, hear me. When you mess up, when you mess up, whether it's, whether, you know, you, you lied or, you know, you, you, you were in infidelity or, you know, you, you, you went somewhere, you said you weren't going to go and you went and they found out you lied or whatever sin you find yourself in in a relationship, hear me very carefully. There is a season where you do have to prove yourself. Yeah. Amen. Yes, you can have my location. You can call me five million times a day. But listen to me very carefully. That season at some point has got to come to an end. You can't be watching me 10 years from now. Because, because if that happens, your surveillance in one season becomes manipulation in the next. Manipulative surveillance. It's when I'm no longer doing what I used to do and I've absolutely changed and you've acknowledged I've changed, but now you have a control spirit about you. Because out of our brokenness, because you didn't heal, now you have a, you have a, a, a controlling spirit. And now you are addicted to dr- trust by verification. I need you to verify. Where are you? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm at the gas station. FaceTime me right now. Because of a lie I told you 15 years ago? No, this is now manipulate, this is manipulative surveillance. And I don't want to be in manipulative surveillance. I want to be in healthy surveillance. If you need me for a season, that's fine. But at some point, if I'm going to love you, I have to stop proving myself to you. So I can love you properly. I'm not talking to anybody in this room here today. Come on, t- tell somebody, say surveillance is only for a season. Here you are looking at their location every five seconds. You got work to do. Amen. <laughs> Surveillance is necessary. And, and here's the thing. If you, keep, if you keep operating in manipulative surveillance, you keep your partner in shame. They never feel like they can be trusted by you. And if I feel like I can't be trusted by you, listen to me. I'm prone to repeat my mistakes. <sighs> Part of my willingness to get out of it is that you believe that I can. I'm teaching better than y'all just said amen. I'm I'm teaching better than y'all said amen. I'm going to say that one more time. Part of my willingness to get out of what I was in is that I need you to believe that I'm able to do it. If you keep presenting to me that you don't believe in me, I'm prone to repeat what I did. Oh, God. Come on, somebody. This is not just marriage. This is also in the spirit. 
Come on, if God ever said to you, you're bad and you're shameful and you're this and you're that, you're prone to go back to your sin like, shoot, if you're not going to forgive me, you're going to die on the cross and still hold my sin against me. I, forget church. I come to church because I've been redeemed. I come to church because he has given me grace. I don't come to church to be reminded of my sin. I come to be reminded of the cross. And if he's not shaming me, neither should my spouse. Oh, come on, somebody. Help me preach in here today. Look down and tell somebody, shake off the shame. Because love can't be real where shame is taking up space. I'm taking you on out of date because I'm, I'm, sh I'm ashamed. I'm, I'm looking good because I'm ashamed. I'm, I'm doing all these things. Because, and and it's, not coming from a, it's not coming from a pure place. So I've got to be willing. Everybody say it one more time. Say, shake off the shame. I've also got to be willing... To celebrate small steps. If I, have, if I have gone through much in my marriage and I'm trying to get to a better place, I'm trying to get to a healthy place, listen to me, I can only get to the big step celebrating small steps. You can't, as a man, call me lazy, call me slothful, and tell me I'm a procrastinator. You tell me all these things. I take it in my spirit. You wake up the next morning and I took the trash out and you act like I didn't just do something. Some of y'all too quiet. If I take the trash out for six months and I take it out, you better say thank you. You're supposed to do that. No, no, no. Celebrate the small step so the small step I can take another step. No, no. Y'all keep it. Y'all, all right. Okay. Because the same thing is true of a baby. A newborn baby is walking around like this. And then when the baby finally lets go and you say, oh, and they take one step, oh, oh my God, he's walking. Now if you say, if you don't pay them no mind, they're going to go right back. But if you celebrate the one step, what do they do? Come on, man, come on, man. And now they're walking because you celebrated every step they took. But if you ignore them taking small steps, I'll go back to what's familiar. If you don't celebrate small steps along the way, I'll go back to what I know. And here you are in pastor's office. He hasn't changed. No, he did. You didn't acknowledge it. Because you want big steps. You want a big step. I can't take a big step. It took small steps to get in what I got in. It's going to take small steps for me to get out of it. Oh, come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. If I smoke every day and I now smoke two times a week, celebrate it. I'm going to get to zero, but can you at least celebrate that I'm not drinking as much as I used to drink? If God honors progress, so should you. I need you to look at somebody in your row and say, celebrate small steps. Don't ever, don't ever give them that. Well, that's what you should be doing anyway. Well, you know what? So you should be doing stuff too. And here we go. You, you, you. Let me tell you what small steps you're not taking. Double barrel. <laughs> I love my church. Everyone say celebrate small steps. Um, I, I, I got to finish, but let me just, I'm, I'm going to be married couples. I'm going to be doing this for three weeks. So this is a three week. I did singles for three weeks. I'm going to do marriage for three weeks. Okay. Uh, so I'm coming back next week and we'll do a little bit more, but. Um, I want you to write down three categories for me. Uh, when the Lord gives it to me, I'll tell you when the Lord gives it to me. When, it belong, when what I'm teaching belongs to somebody else, integrity says I should tell you when it belongs to somebody else. Um, I was reading a book called Routine Relationships by Josh and Katie Walters. And um, in their book, they talk about three separate categories that couples need to pay attention to. So I want you to write these three words down. I want you to write the word daily, weekly, and monthly. Daily, weekly, and monthly. Again, singles, write it down too because you're going to need it. Daily, weekly, and monthly. 
If I'm going to have a solid relationship, there's some things I must do every day. There's some things I must do every week. And there's some things I must do every month. If you're ready, pass, say, Pastor, I'm ready. ready. These, again, are practical things that, that they talk about. Uh, number one, I must pray for the Lord to consistently restore my attraction to my spouse. Let's have an honest conversation. The married couples, if you don't want to agree with me, you don't have to. I'm, I'm preaching the truth even, even if you don't say amen. You're not attracted to your spouse every day. Unless you're married to Pastor Ronell Johnson. Then, then, you, then, then you're attracted every day. Lady Bell, say amen. Say it loud. Amen. All right. Amen. 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 I didn't say you don't love them every day. You love them every day, but you're not attracted to them every day. And sometimes, there's some, and, and some, sometimes your lack of attraction doesn't even have to do with them. Sometimes your lack of attraction has to do with you. Your body's changing. Life has changed. Schedules change. You, you don't think anybody's attractive. Amen. Right now, I just want some M&Ms. That's all I want. I don't want to see, I want to see nobody. Don't want to do nothing. I just, want, I just want to drink some water and be happy. You're not attracted every day. But listen to me. Even though you're not attracted to them every day, Every day you ought to find something attractive about them. And your prayer's got to be, Lord, let me see something beautiful in them every day. I don't care if her shoes are off. Compliment her hair. I don't, when she takes her wig off, compliment her nails. I have a wig anointing today, clearly, because I've done this a couple times today. And I promise you, I'm going to get a text message after church. Pastor, what is it about these wigs you keep talking about? Amen. Just, I'm just. <laughs> Pray to the Lord to restore your attraction. Philippians, Philippians 4 and 8. Philippians 4 and 8 says this. Whatsoever things are lovely. Whatsoever things are pure. Whatsoever things are of a good report. And all the rest of them. Whatsoever things are noble. Think on these things. Listen. It is, it, your relationship will go a lot easier if you just think better thoughts about your spouse. It's very natural and very easy to think about the wrong things. I can give anybody a mic and say, tell me five things they do wrong. Well, they don't clean, they don't this, they don't. Y'all can go down the list. But if I tell you, tell me some things that are nice. Your first thing you're going to say is, ah, uh, because it's natural to say something wrong. It's natural. It's not natural to think good thoughts. This is why the Bible says think on these things. You have to intentionally put your mind on it. What puts you in a space of thinking good thoughts about your spouse? A couple things you can do. To, to meditate good thoughts about your spouse, a couple things you can do. You can build an album in your phone, Androids. Unless you, if you're, uh, excuse me, uh, Apple people, if you're an Android, you can just print off some photos. Or get one of them Polaroids and stick it in your dashboard. But... If you're an Apple, Elia, you got Apple, right? Amen. Thank you. Amen. Glory to God. Praise God. Happy for you. Praise God. Congratulations. Um, but if you, if, if you could build a, a, an album in your phone of your favorite pictures. No, you can't. But they blurry pictures. Amen. Uh, but you could build an album of, of pictures. that you, When you look through them, it makes you think good thoughts about your spouse. Now, you might have to put a lock on that album because some of y'all, some of the pictures you want to put is low. Mm. Mm. If you're married, you can do it. Just make sure you got a good passcode. Y'all not talking to me. Amen. <laughs> Here's something else you can do. You can also put together a playlist. Apple, we have Apple Music. Amen. Androids have Walkmans. Turn your cassette the other way, side B. But you can put together a playlist on your app of songs that remind you of your spouse. I've never done this on a Sunday, and don't be long doing this. I'm going to ask you real quick. I did this in Aberdeen. They did it real good. Y'all do it real good, too. Somebody give me real quick a song that reminds you of your partner. Real quick. Shout it out. Ribbon in the Sky. Come on. Somebody else. A song that reminds you of your spouse. I want to be with you, Mary J. Blige. Come on, y'all shout it out to me. What? Give me a song. Real love. Real love. I just learned that song. Amen. Amen. 
good, good. Even if y'all single, come on. Y'all know songs that remind you of your partners. Come on, tell me. What song? Rapture of Love by Anita Baker. Yes. What song? My Guy. Who's it by? What's it by? Oh, My Girl. Gotcha, gotcha. Who else? Come on, somebody give me one more song. One more song. What's it? What'd you say? For You by Academy Lattimore. Everybody has a song. Everyone say, I got a song. Come on, singles. Y'all got songs too. Tell me what songs remind you of your partner. Beat it. Get out my life. She's out of my life. <laughs> Never come back. I don't know. <laughs> Look at somebody and say, build the playlist. You got a playlist for everything else. Some of y'all got an intimacy playlist. Ain't nothing wrong with it. Come on. But have a, listen to me, listen to me. Listen to me, church. Listen to me, church. <laughs> Y'all getting excited. <laughs> listen to me, listen to me. Ain't nothing wrong with the intimacy playlist. Have a meditation playlist. I'm talking about a relationship meditation playlist. And this is, yeah, I'm not talking about the spirit. Everybody should have a medit Everyone should have a spiritual meditation. But one that reminds you of your spouse. These songs remind me of my spouse in a non-intimate way. Amen. You don't want to get excited at work. Not that playlist. The regular playlist. Song that we went on a date to. Amen, somebody. Think about your spouse at least 10 minutes a day. Amen. Find ways to verbally, is another one, find ways to verbally affirm each other every day. Find ways to verbally affirm each other. Hey, I love your hair today. You look great. Thank you for being a great mom. Thank, you know what? We got problems, but you're a great father. I, I, I appreciate you. I love you. Baby, when you get a shape, shape up, mm. when you got your hair done, girl, when you get your nails done, oh, it's fresh. I love it. I lo because whatever you want to repeat, you have to celebrate. Whatever you want them to repeat, you must celebrate. Whatever you want repeated must be celebrated. If I want to see something repeated, what I got to do? Celebrate it. Verbal affirmation is key. Let me, let me throw this in here for free. As important as verbal affirmation is, it is equally important to disengage in verbal abuse. Some of us have to reset the way we talk to each other. Come on. If every time you get angry, you cuss, don't get mad when they start cussing back at you. I've been married 13 years. I've never cussed at my wife. Because, because, number one, she doesn't drive me to that place. But number two, it's not in me. And, and some of us are, 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 don't get me wrong, I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to shame anybody because that might be your thing. Everybody has a decent. I don't cuss, but I have a decent. Tell somebody, I have something. So I'm not saying that to shame nobody. I'm saying that for this point. The point I want to make is I don't want my wife to cuss at me so I don't cuss at her. Whatever I want to see in my marriage, I've got to be the example of it. If I don't want you to talk to me like, like you're crazy, guess what I got to do? Not talk to you like you're crazy. Amen. Because it gives me license to, to rebuke you and correct you when I, don't, when I see something in you that I didn't put in you. I don't talk to you like that, so don't talk to me like that. And, and they're more likely to receive it if they think about it and say, you know what? They don't talk to me like that. So I'm willing to change my behavior. But some of us are loving couples but toxic when it comes to communication. Y'all don't want to say nothing to me, but it's true. We have to find new ways to communicate. And it's harder to find new ways to communicate when you've been doing it for so long. It's going to take a minute to change a culture. How do you change culture? You change it when you're not in the heat of a moment. You can't be angry with each other and say, well, let's change the way we talk to each other. No. Let's go on a date. Let's go on a date and talk about communication. Baby, we're having a good time. I want to talk about our moments. I want to talk about moments that we get angry. We're taking it too far. I want to change how we do it. I'm committed to doing my part. 
and making sure that I don't raise my voice at you. Because you've already expressed to me that raising my voice at you makes me feel like I'm talking down to you. So I'm going to do my best not to raise my voice. Now I'm asking you to have patience with me because I'm used to doing it. Somebody help me. Come on. Some things that I'm used to, I do it naturally. So I'm going to struggle. But I'm telling you, I'm committed to doing a better job. And I'm asking you to do the same. These are the things I don't like about how you speak to me. I'm asking you to change the way you talk to me. By the time we get to an argument next time, it's not even an argument. Now it's just a disagreement. Because we've set the tone when we weren't in the moment. Am I helping anybody in this room here today? All right, everyone say daily. I, I, I got to finish. Let me talk about the weekly ones real quick. Uh, uh, oh, oh t- two more things in daily. Two more things in daily they said. I think it's important. To, I'll just do it real quick. Uh, they said, touch each other whenever you are close to each other. Y'all shouldn't be in the hallway of your house walking like coworkers. I mean, slap something, grab something. Y'all not, y'all not talking to me. Come on, somebody. I mean, you walking and just rubbing my elbow. My elbow's fine. Put your head on my head. Don't put it on my neck. Do something. Amen. The kids touch me more than you. Come on. We're in the hallway together. Let's have a moment. <laughs> the last one in daily is take and give longer hugs. Take and give longer. Give and receive longer hugs. Take a minute sometimes. I know you're moving fast in the house and there's a million things to do and you got something on the air fryer and you got something in the washing machine and, you know, you got the kids outside and the dog is running. But just for a second, hold on. Just hold Weekly. 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 Set aside weekly or bi-weekly time for intimacy. Now, I've, I've shared it before, I think, in some context, but I'll, I'll share it again. There's two types of intimacy. There's, there's uh, spontaneous, spon- thank you, spontaneous I was trying to say spontaneously, that's why. But spontaneous in- intimacy, and then there's scheduled intimacy. And nothing is wrong with either one, right? If you are in a season where it's more advantageous for you to be spontaneous because you, you, you don't want to be a scheduled person, you want to be able to just do whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it. I'm feeling it right now. Hey, baby, let's go. Sorry. My, my executive assistants give me that signal. You about to go viral. Stop. <laughs> Spontaneous. Uh, uh, sp- what I say? Spontaneous. I need to just go back to hooping because this don't work for me. <laughs> Spontaneous intimacy is fun when it works. But sometimes your schedule is so crazy and your body's so crazy and we're getting older. You're not talking to me. We're getting older. That sometimes spontaneous fun just don't work like it used to. So now I have to schedule intimacy. And scheduled intimacy is also okay. Because I know every single Tuesday that's our night. So I'm ready. Every single Tuesday, I'm ready. I go through the day. You could be texting each other all day. Oh, baby, I can't wait to see you tonight. I want you to wear this. I want you to do this. Schedule intimacy can be fun now, too. Because you can work up to it all day and all week. So tell somebody, say, both of them work. But pick something. Pick something. If schedule don't work for you and spontaneous, spontane- spontane- I am struggling today. Spontaneous intimacy. I didn't have this problem in Aradine. That's a spirit. So schedule time, schedule times of intimacy. Be engaged in conversations. Be engaged in conversation. Here's the reality of conversations. There are times that your spouse will talk about things that you're not interested in. Right? My wife has a nine to five secular job. I don't know any of her coworkers. Neither do I care about any of her coworkers. 
But when she comes home talking about her job, it's my job to engage in her conversation because it's important to her. Are you hearing what I'm saying? She can't talk about it at work because those are the people. So she got to come home and talk to me and I better be ready and available. And I have to act like I care, which I do because I care about her. You know, Johnny and Sally were da na 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 na. Well, let me. Oh man. Shaniqua and Leroy was not not that Leroy. Just saying a black name. Let's just say Glenn. Shaniqua and Glenn. Oh Shirley. Shirley and who? Gary. Gary there you go. Shirley and Gary. <laughs> Shirley and Gary at work, and they were doing this, and they were doing that, and they were doing this. And I got to be engaged in the conversation because it's important to her. At least once a week, we got to engage in conversation that may not be beneficial to us personally, but it matters to them. Yeah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. The last one in weekly, they said, is find times to worship together. Yeah. I said this in Aberdeen this morning. It dawned on me when I was studying for this message. It dawned on me that I am a musician and my wife is a singer. and I've been married for 13 years and it dawned on me just this weekend that we've never sung and played together, just the two of us. All these years that I've played, I've played for churches, I've done this, I've done that, I've, I've gone on planes and played places, but it's never just been the two of us in a worship moment where I'm playing and she's singing. That's never happened. Now, we have the opportunity to do that because we're both uh, musically inclined. But for those of you who are not musically inclined, there are other ways to worship together. Right? If you, if you don't sing at all, you can, you can get together and put on a song. Yeah. Now, come on, let's just spend a moment in worship together. Let's just sit here and think about the goodness of God. Just, we do everything else. Yeah. When is the last time y'all worship together? And you got to exclude worshiping in the sanctuary because that don't count. Yeah. And we all worship it together. But when do we have a worship moment together? I am driving you to work. Yeah. Right? Instead of us being on our phones, let's worship together. Yeah. What song do you want to hear right now that brings you into the presence of God? Let me come into the presence of the Lord with you right now. Put a song right now. Let's just worship. Let's just sing together. We don't even know how to sing. But let's just sing together so we can have a moment of worship together. There's nothing more beautiful than spiritual intimacy. Don't leave out physical intimacy now. But spiritual intimacy is also important. And listen to me. Physical intimacy will be a lot stronger if we have spiritual intimacy. Come on, somebody. When, when we know how to pray together, we could do some other things together. Amen. So only some of y'all got that. Okay. Monthly is my last one. Monthly only has one thing in it. Monthly only has one thing in it. Take one date night a month. Do something together once a month. As a, a date night. And go and do something. It doesn't have to be a date night. It could be a date day. But here's the reality. You can schedule everything else. Schedule some time with your spouse. Let there be something on your calendar that says date night for the two of us. And don't cancel it. Don't keep moving it. Because we need those moments to just reconnect. I said this this morning in Aberdeen. To have a good date night, don't take money. A good date night takes intentionality. All right. One of my most, I've, I've said this before, so for some of you this isn't new, but we have a lot of new members, so I'll say it again. Uh, I remember, welcome, amen. Uh, I remember one year, I think it was like year two or three, um, my wife and I were broke, broke. You ever been broke, broke? No. Broke is like I ain't got no money. Broke, broke is when I owe my money, money. Like your account is down $300 and somebody blesses you with $100 and you still in the red. I'm paying my bank back. And you're just depressed because that money, you don't even see it. I'm just trying to get back to zero. Y'all don't know that kind of broke, broke. When somebody wants to bless you, you give me cash. You send it to my bank, send it to your, I'll transfer it to your bank. No, uh I won't see it if you take, <laughs> tell somebody broke, broke, broke. I'm going to tell you the story, but take 10 seconds to thank God the way you are right now. Come on, he blessed you with something, didn't he? Hallelujah. 
Thank you, Lord. I could run right now. I've been broke, broke, but I've also been blessed, blessed. Um, watch it, Zion. I got to get out of here. Um, one time we were broke, broke. And so we didn't have no money. And uh, I, do I have to stay up here? Is that easier for you? Because I know we have media issues. Are we good? Can I walk? All right, good. I would have walked already. Um, uh, I need y'all to give, give, because we're working on we need to We get, need to get a brand new camera for our church. Amen? Amen. Um, we need to get a camera, camera. <laughs> um, what, it was about maybe year two or three. We were broke, broke, and it was our anniversary. It was our wedding anniversary, and we didn't have no money. How many of you know to sit on the beach is free? So Minister Latanya, we said we had no money. He said, let's just put, let's, let's just get in the car and let's just go to Ocean City for the day. You ain't got to get a hotel. Get a hotel, but then you can get one of them little water fountains and wash your feet off and get in the car and go back home. And so we went outside and brought our own food from home. We brought our own towels. We don't need none of the rental chairs. We got our own chair. Amen. Lay out on the floor in our own towels. And lay out in the sun all day. You hungry? Yeah, I'm hungry. Amen. Open the, open the bag. Here we go. I'm gonna eat right here, right now. Got a cooler with some f- c- Gatorades in it, whatever. Before we left, we went into CVS. We went to CVS, and we were so broke, we couldn't even afford the card on the rack. And so we stood in the aisle at CVS and pulled out a card each and stood in the aisle and read it to each other. And put the card back. Now, my wife and I have been to Mexico. We have traveled. We have done all these different things. That date stands out more than any other date. Because it takes intentionality. A good date doesn't take money. A good date takes intentionality. I would rather you be intentional than than us go to Switzerland together and sit on mountains and you don't talk to me. What's the point in going hiking and going lodging and doing all these be- beautiful, extravagant things and come home and we still don't know how to communicate? Sometimes the best, you could talk to some people in this room who have stories of, of, of great date nights that took little to no money. Just us just talking and communicating with each other. Some of the best nights you will ever have will not cost you a dime. Ain't got to post nothing on Instagram. It's my memory. It's your memory. So once a month, make a memory. Once a month, do something together. And you got to post it. We out here in the Bahamas for the weekend. You don't have to go to the Bahamas. Take a walk down your street for an hour and just laugh at funny movies and do whatever you want to do. And y'all have a great time. Who's your favorite comedian? Tell me their favorite line. Before you know it, it is not Martin. I rebuke you, woman of God. (laughs) She's going to try me. (laughs) Find, find your thing. Let everyone say, say it with me. The key to a good date night is intentionality. Pastor ain't got no money. Don't need it. Write a good long text. Hey, baby, I'm just thinking about you. With good emojis. Find you a good emoji. You, find a good emoji, one that she only understands. One that he understands. You know what this means. That's our emoji. You know what we'll do tomorrow if during the day you text your spouse and said, here's 10 things I really appreciate about you. I take that over money any day. Words of affirmation. Darling, I love you. You're a great mom. I appreciate everything you do for our family. Those are some of the things that you could do monthly. Um, let me finish with the scripture and I'll, I'll close. I wanted to talk about something else, but I, I'm, I'm out of time, so I'll do it next week. Can you put the scripture up on the screen and I, I'll finish with the scripture? Oh, I didn't give you the scripture, did I? I did. I, I did it. I did that twice today. Lord, forgive me. I'm so sorry. Now, y'all who know who come every week, y'all know that we live on the word of God now. Amen. Tell somebody we a word church. Amen. So. I repent for not giving you the scripture. Uh, let, me, let me finish with it. I'm not going to break it down or teach it or anything. I'll teach it next week. Is that okay? 
I will, we'll do it next week. I'm going to be on marriages for three weeks. I'll break it open next week, but I will give it to you. Hosea chapter 2 and verse 14 through 16. And then we'll close. There's a lot of marriages in the Bible that you can talk about. Uh, Mary and Joseph, Zechariah and, and Elizabeth, Abraham and Sarah, uh, Isaac and, and Rachel. So many you could talk about. This particular one, and I'll, I'll, I'll dive into it next week, is between Hosea and Gomer. Yeah. Hosea and Gomer is a powerful couple in the Bible because it is a reflection of Christ and the church. Listen to what Gomer, say, uh, uh, Gomer says to, to uh, Hosea says to Gomer, really. But it's a reflection of God and his church and, and for us married couples today. But then I will win her back once again. And I will lead her into the desert. If I want to, if I want to have a successful marriage, I've got to be willing to win her back. Now, I want to use her and him as interchangeable. Because sisters, sometimes you do things, you got to win your husband back too. Come on, sisters, talk back to me. So see it as interchangeable. I will win her back once again, and I will lead her into the desert. It means I'm going to take her to a place for us to heal. And speak tenderly to her there. How do I speak to her? Everyone say tenderly. There's a way to communicate when we're not doing well. I will return her vineyards to her and I will transform the valley of trouble. Uh, that, that valley of trouble um, is the valley of Achor. And I'll talk about that next week, what the valley of Achor is and what it means to the scripture. But the translation of it is actually in the New King James Version. I'll transform the valley of trouble. And whatever's troubling you, here's my assignment. To turn our valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. I want to take all the broken pieces of our relationship and turn it into a gateway of hope. Even when I'm not responsible for the trouble. Gomer was unfaithful, but Jose is going to fix it. Good God Almighty. That's grace. One of us may have broken it, but it's going to take both of us to fix it. God extends grace, I have to receive it. She will give herself to me there. Why? Because now she finds herself in a safe place. As she did long ago when she was young, when I freed her from her captivity in Egypt. And look at the response. Next verse, and I'm done. Look at the response. When Gomer, when Hosea treats Gomer right and the marriage is going right and we communicate properly, look what happens. When that day comes, says the Lord, you will call me what? Say it real loud. You call me what? Instead of what? Here's the reality of some relationships. It feels like work. Get home and sit outside for an hour. Because it's discouraging when I have to work a nine to five job and then come home and do more work. Because my house is no longer my safe place. It's discouraging when I have an employer at work and have an employer. I feel like I have an employer at home too. Like when I get home, you're going to tell me all the things that I did do right. Instead of feeling like a spouse, sometimes I feel like you're my master. But the scripture said, when I'm done fixing this relationship, you're not going to call me master no more. You're going to call me your husband. And when I call you, or you call me your husband, it's because you will understand that I have been intentional about changing our relationship to the point that you feel safe enough to see how, to change how you see me. I'm no longer your master, but I am your husband. Every married couple, I want you one day to be able to look at your spouse. If, you, if you're struggling right now, look at them and say, that's my husband. That's my wife. There's a bunch of people in this church, but only one of them got my name. Only one of them got a ring on their finger that belongs to me. There's a lot of people all in my job, but only one person can claim me as theirs. They're not my master. They're my husband. I have a lot of people telling me what to do, 
But that one, he pours into me. That one, she keeps me safe. There's only one that when I'm broken, I want to lay in her arms and be restored. I want to be, I'll talk about this next week. I'm going to talk about something that the Lord gave me last night called Honesty Hubs. Honesty Hubs. A season of time upon which you give me the ability to be honest without the consequence of your judgment. I'll talk about it next week. But here's the reality. There are some couples who are struggling to tell their spouse things because of fear of consequence. And they want to tell them. But I don't know what telling you does to me. Because telling you I lost my job, I fear telling you I lost my job because you're going to make me feel inferior. What did you do? So you can't keep a job. See, that's why you can't keep a job. So now I, I keep it to myself. I want to tell you, but you're no longer a safe place for me. By the time we finish these three weeks, we're going to stop being masters of each other and be husband and wife again. Do y'all receive the word of God today? Yeah. Give God a great shout of praise in this room. Stand to your feet, everybody. Stand to your feet all over this room. I'm going to dismiss quickly today. Thank you so much for being here today. Would you just hug somebody next to you if they're not your spouse and say, God's got you covered. Come on, everybody all over this room, find somebody. Pastoral Council, would you come? I want